So a group of us are going to speak about this budget deal. And if you believe that the number one job of the federal government is to defend this nation, uh, then we have made a serious mistake in this bill. I've heard House leaders suggest this bill fully funds the military. For that to be true, you'd have to believe that the military is okay if you cut their budget $42 billion below inflation. The party of Ronald Reagan would never allow inflation to reduce defense capabilities. This bill, the top line number, locks in less ships for the Navy at a time China is going to expand dramatically. In 24 and 25, we're going to cap spending at a level that we cannot expand the Navy. And in the same period of time, China is going to go from 310 ships over a 10-year period to 440. Less money for the Marines, less money for the Army, less ships for the Navy at a time of great conflict. Not a penny in this bill to help Ukraine defeat Putin. They're going on the offensive as I speak, and we need to send a clear message to Putin that when it comes to your invasion of Ukraine, we're going to support the Ukrainians to ensure your loss. If we don't do that, then we're going to snatch defeat out of the jaws of victory. Senator Cotton, is, I'm going to yield to him. He has a time problem. But we're going to take some time here to explain to you why those of us who believe that the number one job of the federal government to defend the nation, uh, that that concept has been abandoned and that we are going to insist and fight until we find a way <clears throat> to rectify some of this harm. Okay. Uh, well, with that, I'll yield to my good friend from Mississippi. And, and, uh, and I can assure my friend from South Carolina that when Senator Cotton reaches the floor, I'll yield to him because he is time constrained. What I want to say, Mr. President, is, is what I've been saying all along this year since the Biden budget came out. The, uh, the world is in the most dangerous situation we've seen since World War II. And this Biden budget, which is now enshrined in this debt ceiling bill, is woefully inadequate. It amounts to a cut in defense capability. It, it sounds like an increase. You can call it an increase. But inflation is running at 7 percent. And um, w so we'll have to increase defense spending by that much simply to keep up with what we did last year. And, uh, and we would have to increase by several billions more in order to give us the, the capability that we need to prevent war in the Pacific. And, and so uh, I, I just have to say that the, the fact that this is being called a victory by some people on our side of the aisle is, uh, is absolutely ina inaccurate. Uh, pundits around the country had called this budget amount inadequate. And now, for some reason, because it's part of an agreement that the Speaker has made, uh, it's being applauded. The numbers don't lie. And I'll tell you this. I'll say this to my, my friends. We've got three or four years to get ready for the time when Xi Jinping, the dictator, uh, president for life in communist China, says he wants to be ready for a war against the United States, a war to, uh, to take over the, the island of Taiwan. The decisions we make today can be implemented if we have the resolve to do them by 2027. But we need to make those decisions this year. We don't need to put them off next year, and we certainly don't need to, uh, to, to say we're going to go with the Biden cuts in readiness and do 1 percent more next year. That is woefully inadequate. And, and let me say this before I then I yield to my friend from um, from Alaska. 
it's easy to hide in the in the budget. I'll, and yeah, one one sentence, and then I'll yield to my friend from from um, Arkansas. It's easy to hide inadequacies in a defense budget. Uh, people still get their social security checks. They still get their paychecks. When it comes home to roost for us is when a conflict breaks out. We weren't ready for World War II. And when the flag went up and we were in a war, suddenly we, we were way, way behind. We were ready under President Reagan. And we had peace under President Reagan. When we are ready, we have, um, we have the ability to avoid conflict. And this, this budget simply does not do that. And I'll be happy at this point. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I will yield the floor and uh, let my friend from Arkansas seek recognition. Mr. President. After weeks of negotiating with an obstinate and capricious president, the House of Representatives passed legislation yesterday raising the debt ceiling and establishing budget caps for the next two years. Both Democrats and Republicans compromised in these negotiations, and like every piece of compromise legislation, there are good parts and bad parts of this bill. I want to commend Speaker McCarthy for a number of common sense victories. This bill improves the environmental review process for infrastructure projects. It cuts funding for President Biden's army of IRS agents and saves American taxpayers tens of billions of dollars by clawing back unused COVID funds. Now, the bill doesn't go as far as I might like. It reduces domestic spending to last year's levels, which is better than even more spending in taxes, as the Democrats proposed. But I think domestic spending could return to pre-pandemic levels. COVID emergency legislation was just that, an emergency compelled by Chinese communist lies, shouldn't reset the federal government's budget in perpetuity. But again, I sympathize with the Speaker's constraints of a small House majority in negotiating with the Democratic Party that seems to prioritize welfare for grown men who won't work over our military. And as I noted, there are some victories in this bill, and it prevents a default. Unfortunately, this bill poses a mortal risk to our national security by cutting our defense budget, which I cannot support, as grave dangers gather on the horizon. The bill supporters contend that it raises defense spending by 3.2 percent compared, compared to last year, and that's true at face value. But inflation was 6 percent last year. When you get a 3 percent raise but prices go up by 6 percent, even a small child could tell you that your money won't go as far and your family will have to tighten its belt. And it gets worse next year, when the defense budget will grow by only 1 percent. Who thinks Joe Biden will get inflation to pre-pandemic levels? And even if he did, inflation would grow at least twice as fast as the defense budget, causing even more real cuts to defense. Worst of all, this bill contains an automatic 1 percent sequester based off last year's budget. That means that domestic spending will go up and defense spending will go down if the sequester kicks in. Let me repeat that. If the sequester takes effect, Democrats will get more welfare spending while defense gets cut. Who thinks the Democratic leader will be dissatisfied with this result? More to the point, who thinks he won't use the threat of sequester to extort even higher levels of welfare spending. These three provisions, a cut this year in real dollars, a worse cut in real dollars for 2025, and the automatic sequester based on last year's spending bills conspire to threaten devastating cuts to the defense budget at a time we can least afford it. The bipartisan National Defense Strategy Commission report recommends a real increase to defense spending of between 3 and 5 percent annually over inflation. This bill would cut real spending by more than 5 percent in two years, effectively slashing tens of billions of dollars from defense. How bad is this defense gap? If we continued our recent bipartisan custom of increasing the defense budget from President Biden's irresponsible budget proposals, we could afford four additional Ford-class aircraft carriers, 500 F-35 
fighter jets, more than 91,000 Stinger missiles, or half a million Javelin anti-tank missiles, all vital to our defense and to the defenses of Ukraine and Taiwan. And while we surrender our lead and erode our military edge, our enemies are catching up. Last year, Russia increased its real military spending over inflation by 1%. China increased its real spending by over 6%. And Iran increased its real spending by over 8%. The United States reduced our real spending by over 3%. And this bill, as I've said, would only make matters worse. For years, Washington has gotten defense spending backwards. The budget shouldn't shape our defense needs. Indeed, it cannot shape our defense needs. Our defense needs have to shape our budget. China doesn't become less aggressive or Russia less revanchist or Iran less extreme because our military has shrunk. In fact, the opposite is true. They grow more ambitious and dangerous. The defense budget should rise and fall with the dangers confronting our nation. And I do not believe those dangers are receding. Who here believes the world is safer or more stable than it was a year ago or two years ago? On the contrary, America is in greater danger than at any time in my life. Iran is rushing towards a nuclear bomb. Russia has unleashed the largest European invasion since the Second World War. And China is plotting the conquest of Taiwan. Our military stockpiles are depleted and our defense supply chains are broken or strained. At the same time, our border defenses have effectively collapsed and cartel members, criminal aliens, possibly even terrorists are pouring into our country. We need a military to match this perilous moment. After all, protecting the safety and security of our people is our first and most fundamental responsibility. We cannot shortchange the military today without grave risks tomorrow. The weapons we buy this year will be the ones we field in 2027, the time by which China will be at its greatest relative strength compared with the United States and when war is most likely. I know that holding firm on defense priorities isn't always easy, and as I said, there are parts of this bill that I support, but I cannot support the bill because it does not adequately fund our military given the threats we face. Supporters of the bill contend that the situation isn't as bad as I make it out to be. But their arguments don't hold up under scrutiny. Some have claimed that we could still get more defense funding through a supplemental bill or some other backdoor funding mechanism. But these same hollow promises were made when Congress passed the Budget Control Act of 2011, which devastated our military under President Obama. I ran for the Senate in part to reverse that disaster, and I won't vote for a new disaster with the same promises. And as I've explained, the sequester in this bill actually produces more domestic spending than the bill's core provisions, which encourages irresponsible Democrats to trigger sequester. Others have claimed that we can find efficiencies in the Pentagon to make up the difference. I don't disagree that there's fat to trim in some places in our military, but no serious person thinks thinks that it's enough to make up for tens of billions of dollars in cuts. Moreover, this claim assumes the Biden administration will put our readiness ahead of social engineering. Color me skeptical on that one when they start looking for efficiencies. Still, other supporters have shrugged and deployed the commonly used but rarely persuasive argument that the bill may be bad, but you know, there's no alternative, and it's too late anyway. But it was and it remains our job to craft an alternative. We hear a lot that things that add votes to these big bills get in, and things that subtract votes don't. Again, we know from recent experience with the last two National Defense Authorization Acts that a higher defense number gets nearly 400 votes in the House and more than 80 votes in the Senate. The first thing, the first thing, that should have been settled in these negotiations was a larger defense budget. Democrats have no argument against that recent history. It's indisputable that increases to Joe Biden's defense budgets garner large bipartisan majorities in the House and the Senate. So why wasn't it the first thing settled? I don't know. But the result is that a Congress with a Republican House and a Democratic Senate 
has now produced a defense budget worse in real terms than either defense budget produced by a unified Democratic Congress. I cannot vote for that curious result. And if it takes a short-term increase in the debt ceiling to go back to the drawing board, so be it. Before we vote, I would also ask all my fellow senators a simple question. Do you feel more safe or less safe than you did a year ago? If you feel more safe, by all means, vote to slash our defense budget. But if not, and in your heart of hearts, you know you don't. Join me in demanding that we do what it takes to protect our nation. I yield the floor. Senator from South Carolina. I just want to compliment Senator Cotton for reminding us what the, the job in Congress is to defend the nation and the, the odd outcome here is at a time of growing conflict, we're reducing the Navy. There are 296 ships in the Navy today. Under this budget, by 2025, there'll be 286. If we continue with the Biden budget, there'll be 290. The Chinese Navy today is 340. By 2025, they'll have 400. By 2030, they'll have 440. This budget locks in a smaller U.S. Navy at a time the Chinese Navy is growing dramatically. There's not a penny in this budget to help beat Putin. The Navy is smaller, the Army is smaller, the Marine Corps is smaller. This is not a threat-based budget. This is a budget of political compromise where people have lost sight of what the country needs. We need safety and security. To my House colleagues, I can't believe you did this. To the Speaker, I know you got a tough job. I like you, but the party of Ronald Reagan is dying. Don't tell me that a defense budget that's $42 billion below inflation fully funds the military. Don't tell me that we can confront and challenge China. Everybody in this body is patting themselves on the back that we see China as the most existential threat to America. You are right. We did the CHIPS Act. We're doing things to help our economy combat China. At the moment of decision, when it came to the military, this budget is a win for China. Please don't go home and say this is fully funded, because it is not. Please stop talking about confronting China when you're dismantling the American Navy. How does this end? Senator Cotton's right. We'll be here to Tuesday until I get commitments that we're going to rectify some of these problems. The ranking member of the Appropriations Committee, Susan Collins, has been steadfastly in the camp of fiscal responsibility and national security. This deal has taken the Appropriations Committee out of the game. The CR, which kicks in, cuts defense and increases non-defense, making it really hard for me to believe that we're actually going to do our appropriations job. So what I want to do, I want a commitment from the leaders of this body that we're not pulling the plug on Ukraine. There's not a penny in this bill for future efforts to help Ukraine defeat Russia, and they're going to gain on the battlefield in the coming days. And it's just not about Ukraine. I want a commitment that we'll have a supplemental to make us better able to deal with China. I want a commitment that we're not going to weaken our position in the Mideast. There's a report out today that Iran is planning to attack our troops in Syria to drive us out. We're expending weapons that need to be replenished. Our military is weakening by the day. This budget that we're about to pass makes every problem worse. I want to end the war in Ukraine by defeating Putin. If you don't, he keeps going, and we're going to have a conflict between NATO and Russia, and our troops will be involved. And if you don't send a clear signal now, China will see this as an opportunity to leap into Taiwan. So to the members of this body, we're staying here as long as it takes to get some commitment that we're going to reverse this debacle sooner rather than later. With well, that, I'll yield to my good friend from Alaska. Mr. President. Senator from Alaska. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent for 
Uh, 10 minutes for my remarks as well as 10 minutes for Senator Wicker and Senator Collins' remarks before the vote. Without objection. Mr. President, I think my colleagues are making the really important point of the national security implications of the bill that we're looking at voting on. And I uh, agree with what my colleagues have already said. Speaker McCarthy had a difficult job. I think there's a lot in this debt agreement that's important, that's positive. But the one thing we are not doing here, and by the way, Mr. President, it's the most important thing we do as U.S. Senators, is have a strategy for the national defense of our nation during an incredibly dangerous time globally. We're not doing that. We need a strategy. Already my good friend from South Carolina mentioned some ideas. I'm going to touch on those. But Mr. President, let's just reiterate, you sit on the Armed Services Committee, many of us do. We get witness after witness, including the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the Secretary of Defense, saying this is the most dangerous time since any period in history since World War II. That's the consensus. Not a lot of people would disagree with that. Authoritarian dictators with immense appetite for conquest are on the march. And yet, what does this budget agreement do? It cuts defense spending significantly, as already mentioned. Now, some people will say, well, look at the top line. It's, we've never had a higher top line, 800 plus billion dollars. Mr. President, as you know, the actual real measure of how serious we are as a country isn't the top line because of inflation over the years. It's hard to compare. The real measure of how serious we are in terms of what we're putting towards defense, the number one priority of the U.S. Congress, should be in my view, is what percentage of our national wealth we're dedicating to defense. And this budget will take us in the next two years with the cut this year, inflation adjusted cut of four to five percent, and a nominal increase next year of one percent, which would be about a five to six percent cut, it will take us below the three percent of GDP number for defense for the first time since 1999 during the peace dividend era of the Clinton administration. So we will, below, we will be below 3% of GDP. You look at different periods of American history, the Korean War, we're above, almost 15%, Vietnam, 8%, Cold War, Reagan buildup, almost 6%, Iraq, Afghanistan, war on terror, 4.5%. We're gonna be going below 3%. Hasn't happened since 1999, and before that, it's almost never happened in the history of the country, at least in the 20th century. And Mr. President, here's the most important point. In 1999, the threats to our nation weren't nearly as dramatic and serious as they are today. And nobody disagrees with that. So what this budget does, it just accepts the Biden defense budget, which as Senator Graham has already mentioned, Shrinks the Army, shrinks the Navy, shrinks the Marine Corps. That's what it does. Lesser ships, not more ships. Smaller number of soldiers and Marines, not more. So accepting the Biden defense budget is actually something new during the Biden administration. What do I mean by that, Mr. President? As Senator Cotton mentioned, the last two previous Biden budgets came in in anemic numbers and in a bipartisan way, strong bipartisan way, by the way, Democrats and Republicans significantly plussed up those budget numbers. Last year, a $45 billion increase to the weak Biden budget on the Armed Services Committee that every single senator on the committee voted for except one. About as bipartisan as you can get. The year before, it was a $25 billion plus up. And Mr. President, as many people know, we were already discussing 
in a bipartisan way on the Armed Services Committee another significant plus up to this Biden budget. So Democrats and Republicans knew it was weak and not sufficient to meet the challenges of today. But what happened? The music stopped. And now all of a sudden we're accepting the Biden budget. I know Democrat senators who think that is wrong. They think that is wrong. So, one amendment I'm going to offer as we're debating this, Mr. President, is to do something very sim simple. It's to look at the Biden Pentagon's priority list, their unfunded priority list, that this president and his Secretary of Defense put forward. It's $18 billion, which the Armed Services Committee, in a bipartisan way, was already getting ready to agree to move forward and fund. And I'm going to ask my colleagues, let's fund it. At a minimum, let's fund it. We're not going to bust out of the top line of this agreement. We'll just take that $18.4 billion and move it from the $80 billion IRS account and put it to the Pentagon. Pretty simple. Should be 100 to 0. Do we want more Navy ships, more Marines, or more IRS agents during this very dangerous time? I think the answer is pretty clear. I think the American people know the answer. So, Mr. President, Senator Cotton already mentioned this idea the speakers talked about. We need more efficiencies in the Pentagon. I couldn't agree more. By the way, the Navy leadership right now, um, we need a lot more efficiencies out of that place. You have a Navy secretary who's more focused on getting his climate plan out before his shipbuilding plan. The priorities in the, the Department of Navy right now are remarkably misaligned with real world challenges. And what are those real world challenges? Mr. President, as I think you were there. We had a brief from some of our top intelligence agency officials, and they came out. It was a classified briefing, but I asked them if this number was classified. They told me no. They came out and said the real Chinese budget in terms of military is probably close to about $700 billion. That's a big budget. And as Senator Cotton mentioned, they are increasing in real terms 6, 7, 8 percent, cranking out ships, cranking out fifth generation aircraft. And we're going to cut the budget this year and dramatically cut it next year and go under 3 percent of GDP at one of the most dangerous times since the end of World War II. As Sen Senator Cotton also mentioned, the National Defense Commission that the Congress authorized a number of years ago to look at the serious national security threats facing our country came back to the Armed Services Committee two years ago and said, what we need to do to address these serious national security challenges from China, from Russia, from Iran, is have three to five percent real GDP or real growth on the defense budget. That was broadly accepted by Democrats and Republicans. As a matter of fact, I think one of the members of that National Security Commission is now the Deputy Secretary of Defense in the Biden administration. But we're not even close. We're going backwards. And Senator Graham's point about a supplemental to get Leader Schumer, the president, to say we are going to have a supplemental for deterring authoritarian aggression is going to be critical. And I would say, Mr. President, the vast majority of my colleagues here, Democrat and Republicans, would support that. We need a serious, robust defense budget to deter war. If the young men and women who volunteer to serve in our military are asked to go fight a war, we need a strong budget so that they can come home victorious, not coming home in body bags. This is deadly serious business. 
We're not putting enough attention to it. It's one of the number one things in the U.S. Constitution that we need to provide for the common defense, to raise and support an army, provide and maintain a navy. That's our job. And Mr. President, we're not doing it with this budget, this rush budget. We need to get serious, and hopefully in the next few days we can do that as we debate this agreement. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from South Dakota. Thank you, Mr. President. I would ask unanimous consent that I be recognized to speak for up to 10 minutes. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. My colleagues today have all had the same concern, and that is, is that while we recognize the need to address the debt limit that our country is now up against, we also recognize that the defense of our country is a critical and necessary part of our responsibility as well. The concern that many of us have is that the proposal right now in order to raise the debt limit is that part of it has a series of conditions with regards to what happens to the dollars that it takes to actually defend our country for the next two years. We want to be able to raise the debt limit. We recognize that. But we also have to address the need for the defense of our country. And why should, as a part of the negotiation, why should we be required to look at a reduction, a reduction in the amount of dollars necessary for our young men and women to be able to defend our country? And yet, within the provisions of this bill, there is a reduction of up to 1% of the existing budget if we don't do an appropriations process. And yet, in order to do the appropriations process, we have to have 12 separate bills. The 12 separate bills all have to be passed. Now, the United States Senate is not known for necessarily doing anything on time. And yet, here we come up to the end of the fiscal year in October, and we haven't seen appropriation bills on the floor yet. What we need to be able to do, rather than to have a 1% reduction in defense, is have an agreement that we will at least allow the appropriation bills to come from the Appropriations Committee, come to the floor of the Senate, so that we can address them, up or down, with the appropriate amendments on them, but to have a full discussion and to do it in a timely fashion. So let's, number one, let's address the debt limit, but let's not penalize our ability to defend our country, or perhaps more appropriately to say, let's not limit the ability of our young men and women in uniform to defend our country. My colleagues have done a great job of explaining what happens here if we don't do our job correctly with regard to this particular bill. Number one, if we go to a continuing resolution, our defense budget goes down. But number two, under the provisions of this bill, the non-defense portions of this budget could actually go up. And so there's an incentive, an unfair incentive built into this to spend more on domestic programs and to spend less to defend our country, which is our primary responsibility. How do we fix it at this late stage of the game? Number one, there are supplementals that are absolutely necessary. We have aggressive authoritarians throughout the world that are right now looking to see whether or not we are prepared to support our allies and those individuals who are on the front lines, specifically in Ukraine, specifically looking as well in the South Pacific and, and looking at Taiwan and doing our best to turn Taiwan into a porcupine, making it much less of a possibility that uh, China will invade Taiwan. But the other piece of this along with that is that we have to do an appropriations process where we actually get a chance to look at the defense bill and our other appropriations bills uh, in a timely fashion so that we do not have a continuing resolution in which the defense of our country loses ground, making it, making it more vulnerable or our, our country more vulnerable and a more challenging job for the young men and women who wear the uniform of this country. With that, I just want to say thank you to my colleagues who have laid out some great numbers for all of us and who clearly have laid out a path forward. 
a commitment by leadership that the appropriations process be completed in a timely fashion, and that there is a recognition that supplemental funding will be necessary to confront aggressive authoritarians throughout the world. And with that, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. President, with that, I yield the floor. Could you note the absent? Note the absent. Never mind. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I think Senator from South Carolina. Uh, I'll be South recognized Carolina. for five minutes. Without objection. Uh, and I will yield my time. Uh, 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 our next uh, speaker is the ranking member of the Appropriations Committee. And I just want to let one thing uh, before she speaks. <clears throat> the Navy's Chief of Naval Operations said we need 373 ships manned, 150 unmanned platforms to deal with the threats we face around the world. We have 296 today. Under this budget deal, we go to 290, 286 by 2025. What does it take to get to 373? The CNO of the Navy said to get 373 ships, you got to spend 5% above inflation for a sustained period of time. This bill is 2% below inflation. So we're undercutting the ability of the Navy to build the ships we need to defend America. With that, I'll recognize Senator Collins. Senator for me. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President. Mr. President, shortly the Senate will consider the debt ceiling package that passed the House last night by a strong vote. I commend the Speaker for his hard work and his negotiations to prevent what would be a disastrous default with catastrophic consequences for our economy, for people who rely on important government programs, for America's standing in the world. Nevertheless, Mr. President, there are two issues in this package that are very problematic. First, as you have heard from my colleagues, is the completely inadequate top-line number for our national defense. Second, is a harmful provision that would go into effect if any one of the 12 appropriations bills has not been signed into law. It would trigger an automatic meat ax indiscriminate across the board cut in our already inadequate defense budget and in the domestic discretionary non-defense funding. This would happen automatically if, in fact, all 12 appropriations bills have not been passed. Now, let me address both of those issues and offer to my colleagues what I believe are solutions. First, the inadequacy of the defense budget. As my colleagues have very well described, the defense budget submitted by President Biden and included in this top, as the top line in this package is insufficient to the task of fully implementing the national defense strategy at a time when we face serious and growing threats around the world. As my friend and colleague from South Carolina and Alaska and others have, have already described, this budget request would actually shrink the size of our Navy. We would end up with a fleet of 291 ships, that is six ships fewer than today's fleet of 297 ships. And it is further, further away from the Chief of Naval Operations requirement 
which is informed by scenarios involving China, for example. Meanwhile, what is China doing? China has the largest navy in the world now, and it is growing to 400 ships in the next two years. The story is very similar if you look at the Air Force tactical aircraft. So we have a real problem. Let me give you another example. It's an example that all of us can relate to who fill our cars with gas or seek to heat our homes. This budget request falls woefully short in funding the fuel costs of our military. The Government Accountability Office says that DOD's fuel costs are likely to be 20% higher than the amount of money that is included in the President's budget. Mr. President, I asked the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, what the result would be. And he says it very clearly. It would translate into 20% fewer flying hours and steaming days, which would harm our military's training and readiness. So that's a very concrete area where the President's budget is clearly not going to be adequate. Second, Mr. President, is the harmful provision with the automatic 1% cut across the board. Well, think about this if you are the Secretary of Defense. Let's say the Department of Defense Appropriations Bill is signed into law before the start of the fiscal year in October, as I hope that it will be and I'm working hard. Doesn't matter. Let's say the ledge branch appropriations bill isn't signed into law by January 1st of next year. An order goes out that has to be implemented by April 30th, which would cut every account across the board by 1%. How does that make sense? Think how harmful that would be. How in the world is the military going to enter into contracts if it doesn't know what its budget is going to be, despite the fact that its appropriations bill has been signed into law, but because of this threat hanging over the department. So what do we do? I don't want to see our country default for the first time in history. I do believe that would have catastrophic consequences. But we need to fix these problems. Well, the first problem of an inadequate defense budget could be addressed and remedied by having an emergency defense supplemental. That is what we need to do. That is what I would ask the administration and my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to commit to, because we know that this budget is not adequate to the global threats that we face. We know that it does nothing to deter Russian aggression in Ukraine. We know that it's not adequate to the challenge that we face from China. An emergency supplemental must be coming our way to remedy the first problem. What should we do about the second problem? The threat of this 1% indiscriminate meat tax cut across the board. We need to pass each and every one of the 12 appropriations bills on time before the start of the fiscal year. And in order to do that, I am working very hard with the chair of the committee, Senator Senator Murray, but we need a commitment from the Senate Majority Leader that he will provide us with floor time. We will do 
our utmost to get every single one of the 12 appropriations bills marked up and reported out of the Appropriations Committee. But then I am asking the Senate leader, majority leader, to commit to bringing each of those bills to the Senate floor, either singly or individually, or as many buses as we used to do, where we would pair a couple of the bills together. But it's essential, and I would implore the Democratic leader to provide the commitment that he will bring each of the appropriations bills to the Senate floor so that we can avoid the threat of this indiscriminate across the board cut. So Mr. President, I believe that that is the path forward for us. An emergency defense supplemental to make up for the woefully inadequate budget that has been submitted by this administration for the Department of Defense, for our national security. And second, to prevent the 1% cut from ever being triggered, a commitment that all of the appropriations bills will be brought on time to the Senate floor. Then, it seems to me, we can proceed with this package and avoid a catastrophic default for our country. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator for South Carolina. Thank you. I want to echo what Senator Collins just suggested. How do you uh, begin to turn this debacle around? You admit you got a problem. It's pretty hard to quit drinking if you don't admit you got a drinking problem. So what she's suggesting is that we acknowledge the obvious, that this bill on the defense side is inadequate to the threats we face. That uh, a bill that funds the Pentagon below inflation at a time of great threat is not fully funded. Uh, that she is trying to get us to wake up to the reality that if we don't speak about defeating Putin now, then the Ukrainians who are on the offense will uh, be undercut. I'll never let this happen again, as long as I'm here, to let people negotiate behind closed doors and not tell me what they're doing on defense. I blame myself for not being more involved and more active, because in my wildest dreams, I never believed that the Republican Party would take the Biden budget that they've attacked for a year and celebrate it as fully funding. I know who I'm dealing with now. Here's what Reagan told the Russians, trust but verify. I will never ever trust again because you got an R behind your name that you're going to be the party of Ronald Reagan. You have to prove that to me. So as we go forward, the game will change. Why is she asking this to be done? If we don't commit to an orderly appropriations process, it gets worse for the Defense Department. The people who wrote this bill, I would not let you buy me a car. The provisions of sequestration, for lack of a better word, the continuing resolution, if we don't do our legislative business, increases non-defense spending decreases defense spending. I thought we were Republicans. Who came up with that great idea? The top line is inadequate. The CR is a devastating. And what bothers me the most is that we would put the Department, Department of Defense in this position. We're playing with the men and women's lives in the military their ability to defend themselves as some chess game in Washington. Well, this is checkers at best. The fact that you would punish the military because we can't do our job as politicians is a pretty sad moment for me. 
But people in this body on my side of the aisle have drafted a bill that would punish the military even more if we fail to do our basic job. That cannot be the way of the future. So I will insist, or we'll be here to Tuesday, and I'll make an uh, amendment to avoid default for 90 days, ever how many days it takes to get this right. I don't want us to fall on the debt, but we're not leaving town until we find a way to stop some of this madness. So you're not going to be able to blame me for default because I'm ready to raise the debt ceiling right now for 90 days, no strings attached, to give us a chance to stop this insane approach to national security. I'm supposed to talk to President of uh, Ukraine this afternoon. <clears throat> I'd like to be able to tell him something. Oh, by the way, you've done a hell of a job with the money we've given you. Not one soldier has died. The weapons used by Ukraine has punished the Russians' military. They're, they're weakened and bloodied. They're about to take back territory. He's wondering, well, what does this mean for the future? I want to try to be able to tell him I've got an assurance, assurance from this body. We're not going to leave you hanging. It is in our interest to beat Putin. I don't like war any more than anybody else. But if Putin gets away with invading Ukraine, there goes Taiwan. And if you don't get that, you're just, not, you're just out of touch. They have a chance to evict Russia from Ukrainian territory. They need more military help, not American soldiers. If Putin loses, it's a deterrence for China. If Putin doesn't lose, he'll keep grabbing territory until we have a war between Russia and NATO. This is a big, big, big deal. Iran is coming up with a plan, apparently, to drive us out of the Mideast. I mean, that just came out today. China is building, as Senator Collins said, they're going from 340 ships to 440 ships by 2030. We're going from 296 to 290. That can't be the response to China. You cannot say with a straight face that this military budget is a counter to Chinese aggression, that it adequately allows us to defeat Putin. You cannot say with a straight face that this budget represents the threats America faces. A military budget should be based on threats, not political deals to avoid default. Nobody wants to default. We're not going to default. But I'm tired of having default hanging over my head as a reason to neuter the military at a time we need it the most. To the American public, you would suffer if we defaulted. I get it. If this budget is the end of the discussion and we don't fix it, your sons and daughters are going to have more war, not less. You're going to send a signal to all the bad guys that we're all talk. And what you will be doing is putting the world on a course of sustained conflict rather than deterrence. The last time people did this, was in the 30s. They wanted to believe that Hitler wasn't serious about killing all the Jews, that he only wanted some land, that he really didn't want to take over the world. He wrote a book and nobody believed him. The Iranian Ayatollah speaks every day, I will destroy the state of Israel, that we're infidels and he's going to drive us out of the region. China openly confronts our planes 400 feet yesterday. They're testing us every day. Bottom line, folks, we're not leaving until we get a path to fix this problem. Susan Collins, my good friend from Senator Collins from Maine, gave us that path. If you want to go home, fix it. I yield.